Hello and welcome to this edition of the Fit to Respond, Fit to Retire series of PowerPoints. Today we're going to talk about certified fitness coordinators, uh, some special circumstances and special populations they might encounter. One of the things we'll talk about are concerns we might see during testing, uh, specifically regarding the test task performance test, TPT. Sometimes when we might terminate the test. With regard to special populations, we'll talk about people over 40 years of age, those that are recently inactive, health concerns, including diabetes, obesity, musculoskeletal issues, heart disease, exercise, induced asthma, and pregnancy. We won't address heart disease specifically, but we will talk about some aspects of it in the context of other issues. The holistic approach that Salt Lake City Fire Department is trying to take is uh, one of embracing physical and mental health as well as nutrition. Firefighters have a unique job in that we need to operate at a higher level and uh, when the going gets tough, the tough gets get going. That's what we do in the, in the fire service. Fitness allows us to operate at our physical and mental potential, both on and off the job and into retirement. There is a nutritional component to every type of healing, maintenance, and progression. That's not covered in this PowerPoint, but that certainly needs to be part of a holistic approach to all of this underlying everything that's in this PowerPoint. Injury and illness happen and require an incremental approach to recovery. You got to know where you've been, where you are, and where you want to go in order to start that incremental approach. Test termination criteria include angina. If someone has chest pain, stop the test. A drop in blood pressure or excessively high blood pressure. Any sign of poor perfusion, including cyanosis, difficulty walking at a normal gait, confusion, etc. A failure of the heart rate to rise with an increased workload. Noticeable changes in heart rhythm, such as an, in, an irregular heartbeat or palpitations. If your testing subject requests to stop or there's any kind of equipment failure, all good test termination criteria. The rate of perceived exertion or RPE scale I threw in here as a good general reference. This is the Borg scale modified and it should be considered as we train ourselves, as we train others, as we test ourselves, as we test others to give a relative idea of the exertion level of, uh, of our testing subjects where they are, how hard to push, or, or when to suggest backing off. NFPA 1582 is a important reference when considering uh, all of the items in, in this PowerPoint. Uh, of note is that NFPA divides medical conditions into category A and category B, and uh, category A are medical conditions that uh, that do not certify someone as um, able to do the job as a combat firefighter. So if you have a category A medical condition, you are not certified. Category B medical conditions, uh, you, you can meet the medical requirements of the standard and perform essential job tax tasks only if you are not a significant safety risk to yourself or others, other members. Aerobically, uh, 12 METs is often the delineator between category and category, category A and category B. So consult 1582, NFPA 1582 for the specific sections specific to certain conditions. Many of the conditions, many conditions are listed in 1582 and have important guidelines and benchmarks and considerations also talk to your doctor about where you should start and a, uh, ideas for progressing from wherever you are and whatever you want to do. He may ask you to do a PARQ questionnaire, which includes things like, 
heart condition and chest pain and dizziness and the condition of your joints, prescription drugs and other reasons. These are all considerations uh, when dealing with special populations. Test monitoring concerns include subjective criteria, things that you, that things that people will tell you, such as short, I'm having shortness of breath or chest pain, unusual fatigue, nausea, changed vision, lightheadedness, and dizziness. Things you witness or objective criteria include excessive sweating, vomiting, shortness of breath, and unusual fatigue. So all these, cons- all these criteria are concerns that we need to weigh as we judge whether or not to continue or terminate a test. Pregnancy. Statistics show that the majority of women will become pregnant and have at least one child in their lives. As a a male-dominated profession, firefighting uh, has not fully considered uh, this very basic aspect of our lives. Uh, People across the... uh, People related to firefighting across the globe recommend that we accommodate pregnancy in a positive and proactive way. It's just part of a larger umbrella of family issues that we all experience. Both male and, and, and females are affected by these issues at work, and so we should embrace and support pregnancy on the job. This uh, family-friendly policies build loyalty among employees and diminish turnover. And they make a clear statement about the intention of the organization uh, and how it is an inclusive, fair, and welcoming of diversity. Those are concepts that both the city and uh, uh, the fire department embrace. We haven't done a good job of making pregnancy policies clear and accessible but assume they will be used and planned for their use. And these can be found in NFPA standards, in city policies, and in some of our own fire department policies. Also in case law throughout the nation, going back to 1978, uh, that stated that women, uh, pregnancy should be treated as any other medical uh, issue and uh, not as a sole determining factor in whether a person can work or not. For the most part, pregnant women are not sick, especially in the first months of pregnancy. They're often able to do everything they did before becoming pregnant, including fighting fire. And decisions about whether to continue to work are the mother's decisions, not management decisions, as is outlined in this case law by the United Auto Workers versus Supreme Court, or United Auto Workers versus John Johnson Controls in 1991. There are real risks, however, involved in pregnancy and firefighting, particularly related to heat, but uh, other aspects as well. But with respect to heat, elevated core body temperature is known to uh, be a serious risk factor for certain developmental complications, including spina bifida. Fire department cannot legally force a woman to leave active duty at any point in pregnancy if she is otherwise capable of doing the job. It's the firefighter's responsibility to report pregnancy as it is for any other condition that might affect the ability to perform essential job tasks. PPE is not designed to protect a fetus. And during later stages of pregnancy, the physiological facts are that there may be some change in the ability to do essential job tasks, such uh, due to diminished aerobic capacity, diminished balance, speed, and agility. Refer to NFPA 1582, uh, this particular section, medical information regarding issues related to pregnancy and firefighters. Great reference. Heavy physical exertion has been associated with spontaneous abortions. Lifting heavy objects should be avoided during pregnancy. Also excessive heat, toxic chemicals, and catecholamine surges have the potential for fetal harm. So there's a couple of main uh, bullet points to consider as uh, pregnant firefighters 
consider the job. Regarding older athletes, age-related declines do begin in our 50s. One of the most significant is that our resting metabolic rate decreases. And that means that our organs slow down and use less energy. And so more of our available energy is converted to fat. So we gain weight, tend to gain weight as we get older. And studies show that we must increase our exercise efforts to counter this and other physical declines that start in midlife. So I always joke that we have to work three times as hard to stay half as fit. And this is one of the reasons uh, I, I tip, tip my hat to, to nutrition here and say that gut microbiomes matter. Uh, they affect the way we metabolize what we take into our body and they affect our attitudes uh, in general. And uh, this is a growing field in science that we should pay attention to. And it includes considerations of, like uh, kombucha and kimchi and yogurts. Those are foods that contain important bacteria that affect our gut microbiome. Regarding recovery, and specifically older athletes, uh, inadequate recovery can blunt the training effect. So we need to allow for recovery. Some is immediate, some recovery, and some takes uh, some recovery takes a longer time. Protein synthesis is one of those things that requires more time. And as we get older, we our ability to synthesize proteins decreases. Therefore, the recommendation is to eat more protein as a recovery uh, as a recovery routine. Up to 30 to 40 grams after exercise may help. We can also give muscle groups a day of rest by alternating muscle group days or alternate strength training days with cardio days. And at the bottom, there are some nutritional guidelines and some protein contents of specific food groups. Getting older does not mean that we are getting frail, helpless, cognitively less able and incompetent. However, if you believe that getting older does mean those things, then that will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. <clears throat> Studies show that that actually happens. Uh, on the contrary, positive attitudes can result in less age-related declines by mitigating age-related differences, even in the face of genetic predisposition. And one example of that is if you have a a gene for Alzheimer's, you can basically negate the effect of that gene with a positive attitude about aging. And the flip side of that is even if you don't have that gene that predisposes you to Alzheimer's, if you have a negative attitude about aging, you will see greater degrees of cognitive decline as you age. So attitude is very important with respect to aging. Even being exposed to negative attitudes can affect some of these aspects. The American College of Sports Medicine recommends that we do at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity that's working hard enough to break a sweat but still able to carry on a conversation five days a week or 20 minutes or more of vigorous activity three days a week. That's just a basic aerobic baseline uh, and, and starting point or uh, maintenance level physical fitness. Combinations of moderate and vigorous intensity activity can be, be, can be performed to meet this recommendation. Some examples of uh, aerobic exercise are, are listed here and include walking, running, stair climbing, cycling, rowing, cross-country skiing, and swimming. In addition, strength training should be performed a minimum of two days each week. And strength training is uh, outlined as eight to 12 repetitions of eight to 10 different exercises that target all major muscle groups. This can be accomplished using body weight, resistance bands, free weights, medicine balls, or weight machines. We have some great PowerPoints out there on technique and uh, different approaches to resistance training. 
Not everything fits for everybody. Do what fits for you and your body and, and mix it up so that we exercise in different ways and different parts of our body on a regular basis. Detraining definition is a decrease in performance variable following a cessation in training or a decrease in volume, frequency, or intensity of training. So that's what happens when you stop training. Uh, there are aerobic effects of detraining and uh, strength and resistance effects of detraining. It can occur quite rapidly. And one study showed in, 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 in two weeks, people lost 12% loss of isokinetic eccentric strength and a 6% loss of muscle fiber, fiber area. And across the board, all fitness folks recommend that or will say that long breaks in training are unhealthy and should be avoided. Some silver linings at the bottom of this slide here, sedentary people with no training experience have the greatest adaptation potential. That's sort of intuitive, but if you, if you haven't done any training, then you have the most to gain and you can do gain the most, the quickest. Uh, if you are restarting a training program, as the middle bullet point says, you, your changes occur much faster during retraining than they do when you first start. Most of the, at the top of the slide, adaptations to training, or at least initially, are neural adaptations where the neurons, your, mus your nervous system gets together and coordinates your muscles to work better, and then uh, eventually your muscles get stronger over time and bigger. One of the specific medical issues you might encounter is metabolic syndrome, which is a cluster of conditions that occur together, including high blood pressure, high blood sugar, excess body fat around the waist, and abnormally high cholesterol or triglyceride levels. These increase your risk of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. Having just one of these conditions does not mean you have metabolic syndrome. But any one of these conditions increases your risk of serious disease. And most metabolic syndrome disorders have no symptoms, so there's no trigger to uh, instigate a radical change in lifestyle or, or diet. But aggressive lifestyle changes can delay or prevent development of serious health problems. So as a fitness coaches, uh, we can we can be that trigger to change or, or help someone embrace a trigger to change. We're going to talk about diabetes. Approximately 84 million Americans have prediabetes, which is a, a newish term that we should be aware of. It's diagnosed as an A1C of 5.7% to 6.4%. A1C is, a, is measured with a blood test that measures glycolated hemoglobin in the red blood cells and that is analogous to an average of blood sugars over time. It can also uh, prediabetes diagnosed as a fasting plasma glucose of 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter. When I was trained as an EMT and a medic that we we considered 90 to 120 normal blood glucose. Um, nowadays that's being with, with the idea of prediabetes, uh, that might not be as accurate, and we should maybe encourage people to keep their fasting plasma glucoses lower than 100. Diabetes is divided into two types, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 was formerly called insulin-dependent diabetes. It's an autoimmune disease where antibodies attack and destroy the insulin-secreting cells in the pancreas usually develops before age 30, comes on suddenly in normal weight people, and it may be caused by a virus during childhood. Science says heredity is not a strong factor in whether or not you develop diabetes, type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes was formerly called adult onset diabetes. Your beta cells still produce insulin, but it, they are insufficient to overcome insulin resistance of the body cells, so you end up with high blood sugar. It's strongly associated with overweightness or ob obesity. It develops gradually, 
but is now more frequent in young people with the rise of childhood obesity. It can often be controlled without insulin through proper diet, exercise, weight loss, and oral medications. However, if we go down to the bottom of the slide, most patients with type 2 diabetes know that exercise will reduce or in eliminate insulin and other medication dependence, but they still avoid exercise, which speaks to the reason they have type 2 diabetes in the first place. Uh, diabetes is on the rise in American society. It's 9% today, and some estimates suggest that one in three, 33% of Americans born in 2000 or later will develop diabetes, and, and in high-risk ethnic populations, even higher numbers may develop it. Maintaining a healthy weight reduces the risk for type 2 diabetes, and most people with type 2 diabetes can perform exercise safely as long as certain precautions are taken, and those certain precautions are based on your doctor's recommendations and your own physical ability. Both aerobic and resistance training improve insulin action, at least in the short term, and can assist with the management of blood glucose levels. Also, lipids, blood pressure, cardiovascular risk, mortality, and quality of life. Exercise must be undertaken regularly to have continued benefits, and a combination of aerobic and resistance training may be more effective for blood glucose management than either type of exercise alone, as, as it is with regular fitness and, and uh, health maintenance. So check with your doctor. Note that exercise will affect blood sugar. It can go up or down, depending on the individual. And that's why we, uh, diabetics should check their blood glucose before and after exercise to get an idea of how exercise will affect a particular individual. Exercise-induced asthma is can look like poor fitness, but is different. Um, some differentiating criteria include that exercise-induced asthma, or EIA, lasts longer after exercise. Talk to your doc and get prescribed bronchodilators or anti and anti-inflammatory medicines and use them if those are appropriate for you. You can also breathe through your nose to moisten the air. You can stay out of cold, dry air or wear a scarf or face mask. You can exercise indoors. You can participate in lower intensity sports. You can exercise indoors on days when pollutants are high and that is a good recommendation for everybody but especially for EIA sufferers. Most importantly, continue to exercise because exercise training will improve fitness so that a lower level of breathing is needed at a given exercise level and good fitness, cardiovascular fitness will enable you to exercise at a higher intensity before experiencing an EIA attack. Musculoskeletal issues uh, are, are diverse and um, not covered very um, comprehensively in this PowerPoint, but generally speaking, insurance subsidized treatment and physical therapy coverage is designed only to return post-injury function to the most basic level, not the level of a firefighter or tactical athlete. So when your insurance finishes paying for your physical therapy, that is just the end of another stage and there are more stages to be worked through beyond that. Every tactical athlete is different and uh, they consult your physical therapist to figure out where you are, where you need to go, and how to get there. Generally speaking, musculoskeletal injuries require a periodization model for recovery involving multiple phases and these include stability stage, strength and conditioning stage, and a dynamic specific function stage. There are other levels in, within those stages that need to be determined based on you and, and your injury or your client's injury. 
And the, the take-home lesson is that it, it's a long process and requires discipline and awareness of the process of the stages as you work through to get back to a, a level that we want as tactical athletes and firefighters. That's it. That's all I have. This module is obviously not all inclusive. Uh, take care of each other, set your goals, get to work, get after it, and most of all, have fun.